Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, somebody had mu muted me. Uh, is the screen there? You're, sh you're able to see the shared screen, right? Great. Okay, so thank you very much for asking me along uh, to all the people organizing this, Nilifor, Beck, Liz, Rebecca, um, who have I missed? Louisa. <laughs> and um, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic. Now, I, I sort of prepared this thinking, oh, people have heard this before, but I realized not everyone's heard this before. So apologies to those who have heard bits of it or perhaps all of it. And, um, and hopefully those that have never heard it before will enjoy the world of Fusarium wilt of banana. Now, um, just in case I forget to mention the main people at the end, I'm going to put their names up front. And so much of the work I'm going to talk about today is that which has been conducted by Andy Chen, Liz Cheslowski, Jay Anderson, Rachel Meldrum, Nolene Warman, Sam Fraser-Smith, and also Andrea and um, Matthews and Ning Chen. So I'm just going to split the, the talk up into sort of four sections. So I'm going to apologize now. UQ is just one big building site and there's a cement truck that keeps going back and forward outside. So I hope it's not going to disturb us too much. So I'm going to split it up into looking at um, initially banana cultivation, just for those to enlighten those that aren't so familiar with it. Uh, then we're going to talk about the pathogen of interest, a uh, little bit about the interaction on the host, and then we're going to talk about the host a little bit more. And banana has a convenient, you know, everyone's familiar with the shape of banana fruit, but the, the pathogen that we're looking at has the spores the same shape, which are very banana shaped. So, um, okay. Now, in the last four or five years, I think it is, we've had funding from uh, um, Gates, uh, a Gates program, which is, goes through the International Institute of Agriculture, uh, Tropical Agriculture, um, based in the East African nodes of that institute. And uh, because banana is an incredibly important crop to the, the, as a subsistence uh, crop in East Africa. So when we think of banana, we think of banana growing in North Queensland and how important it is to uh, the Queensland economy or, or certainly to culturally to us as well. But if we look at the statistics here, Australia really just ranks 48th in the world as when it comes to banana production. Uganda's 10th, but when we compare that with um, consumption per capita, the countries of East Africa, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, they rate very high in consumption because but to them, banana is a, and particularly in Uganda, is a, you know, their main carbohydrate source. So we, we can look, at, for instance, at the, the sort of diet that they might have in the, maybe eat cassava as well and other things, but, but uh, banana is a very important part of their main diet. It's a more of a cooking banana. And you know, it's problem. It's a bit of a problem getting statistics sometimes on banana because for certain reasons, they split banana and plantain and cooking banana into different groups, you know, when they're looking at agriculture commodities, but it's all the one. So um, for that purpose, you know, when I talk about banana, I might be talking about the cooking starchy banana, uh, not necessarily Cavendish and stuff, but they're, they're all considered banana. I mean, gosh, it's, it's got as low diversity as possible as it is for well, why you would split it up any further. So in East Africa, they, they call a cooking bananas Matoki and Mashari. Uh, being Scottish, it took me a while to work out that Mashari, I used to call it Mick Hare, but it's, it's actually called Mashari. And uh, they do lots of things with banana. They make juice with it. They make banana beer, they make, which is a little bit, well, uh, oh, yeah. not very pleasant <laughs> in my taste buds, but they also make banana gin, which was yeah. quite good. Uh, but we, we look at banana, we see it's seedless, we see it's partner carpic, and we think, how the heck do you breed it? But people are breeding banana. And this is a, an example of uh, uh, production from the IITA program in East Africa. And we see on the left, the two parentals, uh, and here on the right, we have a much higher yield. So banana breeding is possible, and I'm gonna talk about that as we progress. Okay, so... Um, Basically, that's in Africa, they've probably been eating banana for quite 
you know, several thousand years. It was probably brought in by early traders from, from um, Southeast Asia. And, you know, there's lots of books and theories written on that. But uh, banana, as we know it in, in Australia and certainly in Europe and North America, wasn't really consumed much until the end of the 19th century, 20th century. In Australia, it's slightly different. The, the bananas were probably brought by, by uh, the Chinese into Australia in the 19th century, but certainly in Europe and North America, they didn't actually start consuming bananas until the, the advent of the steamship, when trading um, vessels were able to get to these markets fast enough before the bananas had ripened on board. So it was only then that they started growing um, and at that point, most of the banana production for those markets was in Central, uh, Southern, South and Central America. And the cultivar at that time was called Big Gross Michel, or otherwise known as Big Mike, Mike. And that was the principal cultivar of trade. And there's a very good book by, oh gosh, Dan Koppel. It's called The Fate of the Fruit that, uh, that Changed the World. And banana production in the Central American republics was... Uh, heavily politicized, basically because of Fusarium wilt, because at that point it, it got into there in the late uh, 20, 19th century and started causing problems because it's a soil borne pathogen. The banana companies needed new land and so they, they moved to new land and they sort of took it over uh, and caused lots of issues. And I'm not going to go into politics today, but it's a really good read. I would certainly look into it. But anyway, the steamships allowed banana to be transported to North America and Europe from Central and South America. And there was a, a real boom in banana production, uh, banana growth by these companies. And often the companies that owned the land owned the steamships as well. So it was a real export market. And so through that cultivation, unfortunately, Fusarium wilt got in. Now, Fusarium wilt in banana was first described actually in Brisbane. Uh, but as not to say it came from Brisbane, it was just that uh, somebody, um, I guess, with a, a Western education was able to sort of identify it and stuff like that. Uh, but it was in the 1890s, it became real, really serious in tropical America and Central America, and it was so named Panama disease. Uh, so the reference to Panama disease, because obviously it was recorded in Panama, it was recorded in other parts of Central America as well, of course, where it was affecting Gros Michel. I particularly don't like calling Panama, it Panama disease, but that's my own preference. And certainly with the new strains, I wouldn't really refer to them, but it seems to have taken off that way. It's caused by the fungus Fusarium oxysporum. Um, you've probably all heard of Fusarium oxysporum. Oxsporum, it's ubiquitous fungus, affects many different uh, crop plants. It's a root infecting fungus, it enters via the roots, gets into the xylem, travels up through the xylem, causes a wilt and eventually leads to death. And so this image here on the right is one poor little plant that's uh, affected by a fusarium wilt. You can see the collapsing of the leaves, the leaves have gone all um, fluorotic. And uh, if we will look in a minute at some more symptoms associated with it. So the first wave of Fusarium wilt was in the mid 20th century, um, starting off from those infections uh, that occurred in late 19th century. And when Gros Michel was the then trade, uh, cultivar trade. So it was completely susceptible and it became, it was succumbed by other cultivars that were resistant. So yet yeah, we have the thing, yes, no, we have no bananas. Uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that relates to the, Fusarium wilt or not, but certainly those little songs around the time uh, with um, the, the non-availability of bananas. So Ben Rose Cavendish. Now Cavendish became the cultivar trade. Now it's important to mention at this point that Cavendish um, <clears throat> is a, a dessert banana. It's not... Uh, it is becoming increasingly cultivated even in, in subsistence agriculture, but it's 85% um, of banana production worldwide is not for trade, it's for subsistence agriculture. So 15% is certainly mostly based on that Cavendish, but even within subsistence or 
or domestic productions, Cavendish is increasing in, in production, goodness knows why, because it's replacing a lot of interesting cultivars that would be uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and places like that. So Cavendish became the cultivar trade. It was resistant to fusarium wilt at that time. So let's look a little bit of Fusarium oxyborum. It has many forms. And you know, I you know, when I'm talking about plant in lectures, plant, I often say plant pathogens are poor saprophytes. Uh, and so they 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 are outcompeted by saprophytes once the, the pathogen invades the tissue. That doesn't work for Fusarium oxyborum. It's a good saprophyte, it's everything. I don't know why every we're not overtaken by it. It's an asexual member of the Ascomycota. It has a wide host range, but as host specific strains. It's also an endophyte. It can be, you can find endophytic strains within banana. You can find endophytic strains within many crop plants and non-crop plants. It's a saprophyte. So once the tissue dies, it can colonize it. Uh, it can colonize the tissue of other plants too. So we see Fusarium oxyborum. There's a lot of studies being done on tomato. The uh, Fusarium oxyborum pom species is like a persecute because tomato is quite easy plant to work at, particularly on the genetics. Uh, but we also see it in strawberries. We see it in ginger and uh, cotton, and it's caused huge issues in cotton uh, in the in the 1990s and um, cultivars, and we, we just truly still don't have a truly resistant cultivar, we have tolerant cultivars. And of course, it's an issue on banana. These are some ladyfinger plants that have uh, fusarium wilt here. When we look at the symptoms, particularly on banana, you see necrosis at the leaf margins, you can see leaf discoloration, the petiole collapse, uh, sort of forming this sort of skirt, uh, um, and stem splitting is pretty strong characteristic you, you can see down at the base, but it's only when you really cut into the plant, you see the very reliable vascular discoloration where you've got uh, phenolics, et cetera, being produced within the, the vascular tissue in response to the pathogen. So that's very characteristic and eventually the plant will die. Sometimes you, the suckers that come from it will survive, sometimes not. And generally you're not gonna get much of a yield. So just looking at banana cultivation, keeping an eye on the time, bananas are traditionally cultivated by suckers and bits. So you take the, the, the suckers here, can you, hopefully you can see my, my um, um, mouse here, uh, looking at the sucker on the, as it grows. Remember the bananas are, are just basically a big herb. Um, so it's, it's, we talk about it being the pseudostem as opposed to the stem because it's pretending to be a stem. Uh, and um, it, you, you break off the, cult, uh, the suckers uh, or you can actually take that rhizome and chop it up. And there's lots of little buds there that you can break up and, and take and transplant, which is fine. You're dealing with a clonal crop. Um, and you can cultivate it that way. And if you see that traditionally, you know, from one plant, you know, sorry, my, I, I got fed up doing my copy and cut and pastes and reductions, but basically I just wanted to emphasize from one plant, you can get this a whole field eventually cultivated. Now, obviously, if you're dealing with a soil borne pathogen, that's a real big no-no. And that was a problem that happened in Central America in the mid 20th century, is that, you know, they'd say, oh, let's go to some new land that's fusarium free, and they'd take their, their diseased plant tissue with them and replant from there. And we think we've learned lessons, but when Tropical Race 4, which I'm going to talk about later, uh, came in in the late 20th century, people did the same thing again, and they just spread it around. Um, so, you know, from if you start with your mother plant that's infected, everything else is going to get infected and it's going to go into new land, new ground, and it's going to contaminate that. So the answer would be to cultivate from tissue culture plants, which is strongly advised, uh, particularly here in Australia, where you get tissue culture plants, at least you're starting from clean material in the first place. Uh, you're multiplying it up through tissue culture plants. You take, you take the plants out of tissue culture, you take them to a nursery, which should be clean, and then you grow them up and then you plant them into fields. So any new plantings, particularly in new land, should always be from tissue culture. But that still depends on the pathogen 
not being in that soil in the first place or not having been spread into it. So it's not only plant material that can spread the fungus, it's other things like pigs can go and rummage in, in the, the soil that's full of spores or bits of mycelium or bits of debris of plant matter that's carrying the fungus and they spread it from one, one site to another. Beetles can do the same, even then they can go and feed on it. Um, Sorry, the little I didn't couldn't find a nice and uh, agricultural shovel. So, but what I'm meaning is spades and other equipment can spread it. Tractors, vehicles, and we know that when we go up north now, we see all these signs that you can't go into people's properties. You have to leave your vehicle at at the gate, and that's to stop the potential of soil uh, embedding in the tracks that have been carrying fusarium wilt and being dispersed into the next farmer's field. Boots, etc. You know, you change your boots between fields, between farms. Certainly, you know, going onto properties because you, you know they're one of the biggest carriers. You know, all that dirt on the base of your uh, boots is going to be covered in spores and mycelia. Cane knives, to a certain extent, because you're cutting the cane knives in the upper stem uh, and going from there to there, it's not likely to be a route of infection but it's still going to have debris and soil on it. You're going to put your cane knife down on the ground, et cetera. And I'm not going to go into the details. Queensland Biosecurity can have I've got wonderful programs trying to limit the spread of fusarium wilt at Tropical Race 4. This waterfall is meant to illustrate flood waters, irrigation waters can, can move material, can move spores. But the biggest inoculum spreader of all is human beings. Uh, we, we're just so good at spreading things around and. Um, taking material from one place, not doing the right thing. So it's, it's quarantine is very important for this pathogen. So let's look at the types of um, variants of Fusarium oxysporum. It's, very, it's an asexual fungus, but gosh, it's got a lot of diversity. Um, we talk about the, the first wave being caused by race one. Now race one actually consists of several different vegetative compatibility groups, several different genetic uh, groupings. Uh, but those are the ones that can affect lady in here in Australia, ladyfinger and gross Michelle, or um, but Cavendish is resistant. And we 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 were, we were got on fine till the 1990s with the surviving with Cavendish being fine. A few ladyfingers down in, in in northern New South Wales and southern Queensland, and the Cavendish was growing happily, quite happily. Other pathogens affecting, it, of course, but not um, uh, fusarium. And uh, then in the 1990s, we first saw, well, we, we saw it in causing sub, what we call subtropical race four. It was affecting Cavendish in suboptimal conditions and subtropical conditions in Southeast Queensland. Uh, Cavendish started collapsing, you know, bad, but, but not, you know, you, you would have, certainly have a reduction in yield and it was, a, it was an issue. But so far, subtropical race four has been confined to, to this southern corner of Queensland, northern New South Wales. But it was with tropical race four that first came in, uh, first identified in Australia in the Northern Territory that uh, caused the alarm bells because it's a much more aggressive form of the pathogen affects the plants in tropical conditions. We don't know what subtropical race four would do in tropical conditions, but certainly tropical race four. Terminology, why it's complicated. Race, there is a race two, which have, it more or less does the same as race one. Race three doesn't even affect banana. It's just a misnomer, unfortunately. And the other ones have been called subtropical and tropical race four because they affect Cavendish in particular. Okay, so we look at the distribution of these different races within Australia. I don't dwell too much on this, but race one was present for a while. We saw it. In, we see it in North Queensland on Ducasse, we see it here in, in Southeast Queensland, Northern New South Wales, and it's in Western Australia. And then came subtropical race four became an issue and then tropical race four, an issue in the Northern Territory. And then more recently, unfortunately, tropical race four has gotten to the principal growing area of banana in Australia, which is in the top, in, um, North Queensland, uh, around the Tully Valley areas and just north of that, uh, and it's an issue. It's, it's now on five properties, but um, they're doing a fantastic job in trying to contain it, uh, um, and it hasn't spread. It is 
being spread, I should say, whether it's by pinks or beetles or whatever, but relatively slowly. So hopefully slow enough in that we can develop resistance by whichever means and have some uh, alternative to Cavendish. I'm going to move a little bit quicker now here. So Tropical Race 4, it's now an issue. You know, we, we think we've got a problem here, but um, if we look at some of the countries of Central and South America where banana, commercial banana exports are such an important part of their economy, they are actually quite um, terrified of Tropical Race 4. Their, their uh, uh, commercial export markets are based on Cavendish. Cavendish is highly susceptible. So it's, it's, it's in Colombia, it's now in Peru, um, and um, we, we saw it spread in Southeast Asia in the 1990s and early 2000s. It's, it's uh, caused havoc in China. It's now in India. India is the biggest banana producer in the world, mostly for the domestic market. They do have, um, uh, have Cavendish types there. And it's not just Cavendish. There are other cultivars that are susceptible to it. In Africa, it's in Mozambique. It's not in East Africa yet, um, Uganda and Kenya. We don't know for certain if we know that the Mashari cooking banana could potentially be susceptible, whether the Motoki ones are, we're not quite sure. And it's not, nor is it in West Africa in amongst the plantains. And again, we need to see whether they're susceptible or not, but it's caused havoc in the Philippines and, and in Indonesia, except particularly with the export markets. Okay, so how to control, you know, this is it's a plant pathologist's dream, well, not dream, nightmare, I should say nightmare. How to control this persistent soil-borne fungus with saprophytic capabilities in a monoculture of single genotype, clonally propagated perennial crop, mostly grown in areas of high rainfall. You, you couldn't actually devise something that's, that's more of a problem plant, plant pathogen-wise. So... How do we control it? We can control it by quarantine, by biosecurity, by, by implementing good containment uh, uh, protocols, whether at a local farm level, a regional level or a national level. In order to, to administer good biosecurity, we need good diagnostics. For good diagnostics, you need to study the pathogen's diversity. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, cultural control. We've, we've known this pathogen for 100 years, over 100 years. There's still so many gaps, that things that we need to find out. And the more we find out about the spread of this fungus, about its spread within the plant, uh, between plants, its persistence, uh, the better. And so more and more that we, is needed to study there and resistance. Uh, and there, you can breed bananas, uh, but uh, much of the studies in, in banana uh, breeding have just gone full in because it's such a problematic crop breeding wise they've gone full in and just done the breeding without doing the background genetics so that's one thing I like to emphasize that you need genetics and breeding um, um, in order to understand the, the genetics of resistance and how to introduce it into the crop okay so let's move on to look a little bit at the pathogen. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the term vegetative compatibility groupings, and I'm not going to go into details of that. Uh, much of the VCG analysis of Fusarium oxysporum strains uh, that in Queensland are done, it's done at um, Bogger Road, and Wayne and Neil's certainly one of the world experts, I would say, on the analysis of that in Fusarium oxysporum. And basically, you're just VCGs are a means of identifying genetic groupings because it, within a VCG, it, it's compatible with other isolates within that same VCG. And it's just there's a, a little trick way that you can, by bringing a couple of mutants together, we can see if there's com, um, com, complementation of certain pathways. So I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it's a convenient way of identifying associations with certain races of the pathogen. So if we look at uh, race one, we know it's got all these VCG groupings, and it's not just done for Fusarium oxysporum cubensi affects banana, but other Fusarium oxysporums and for other pathogens, uh, they also use VCG groupings. So we can, we can link the VCG groupings to certain races of the pathogen, certain races by meaning that those are the ones that can attack 
Ladyfinger or, or, or Cant attack Cavendish, vice versa. So we, we group subtropical race four is quite distinct and VCG grouping from that of tropical race four. So tropical race four generally uh, focuses around these VCGs in particular one, two, one, three, and one, two, one, six. So if you traditionally, if you want to identify that you've got tropical race four, particularly if you've got Cavendish that's come down, you have to make sure is it tropical race four or is it just subtropical race four, you would have done a VCG test, which can take up to six weeks. Um, so for the purpose of diagnostics and also for the purpose of finding a little bit more about the pathogen, many groups have done phylogenetic analysis of various Fusarium oxysporins, not just of Cubensi, uh, to see where they place with each other in relation to, to um, phy phylogeny. And we find that the race one and race two uh, group, group together in a, a one clade and tropical race four and uh, subtropical race four group together in another clade, but again, quite distinct from each other. And that's based on some core genes and uh, on the sequences of um, some core housekeeping gene analysis. Uh, so it's it's quite distinct. And in Australia, we have all three variants uh, well, or races uh, now, unfortunately, but in different locations. There's recent proposals that suggesting that we, we change the name of Fusarium oxysporma because it's more than one, just one species. It's always a bit tricky how you define what species is of an asexual, a grouping of asexual fungi. I'm not going to go into the taxonomy of that. I think it's quite um, understandable that you would certainly, the, the what we call clade A and B do look to be quite genetically distinct. On the plant, they look the same. The mycelia looks the same, the spores look at us. Some people say there's slight variations, a slight variation, volatiles, etc. But at this point in time, I'm still going to call it Fusarium oxysporum uh, until we, we get all this sort of um, terminology sorted out. So, Fusarium, moving on from core genes, there was uh, work done on, as I said before, tomato is a much easier system to work with. And uh, in the Netherlands in the 1990s, they started looking at these little peptides that were expressed in the plant by the fungus, and they called them secreted in xylem genes. And they then did reverse genetics to identify what these peptides were. And it turned out they were some of the, the classic avalence or what we now call effector genes that were associated in the gene for gene interaction in the tomato Fusarium oxysporum uh, um, pathosystem. So we, we looked at these six genes and wondered if, oh, I wonder if there's any in Fusarium oxysporum cubensi. So this was the work initially of Rachel Meldrum and then of Sam Fraser Smith, where they looked at these corresponding six genes. Now, sorry, the terminology is, in, so it means secreted in xylem. And to date, there's uh, published at least 14 different six genes. So now when I say 14 different, they're distinct genes. Within those, um, each gene within six, six ones, you, you're finding different um, variants, different sequence and uh, variation. So it it's, gets quite complicated. But uh, basically by looking at presence and absence initially of six genes of six one to, through to eight, we found that we could distinguish on superficially between um, uh, races one and subtropical race four and tropical race four by presence absence. And this was done just by doing, um, well, initially by Southern analysis, which nobody does anymore, but then by uh, doing PCR and we, we could see a presence absence pattern. So that was quite convenient for an initial um, diagnostic just to, to, to try and distinguish what was tropical versus subtropical race four. So Liz Chislowski has, um, taken this, um, took this further in, in her PhD studies and assessed a wider range of different uh, isolates of FOC and non-FOC isolates uh, to looking at the six gene pattern on that and published this work uh, and with a subsequent publication. Uh, and she used um, what we call my seek analysis, for, uh, many of you are probably familiar with it, but just to, to briefly go through it, you compare uh, uh, amplified uh, sequences uh, within the, the genome of, and compare them against a reference. And in the case, initially the reference was against the tomato one, and then we built our own references to look at a pattern of the, 
the sequences that encode for these six genes uh, in these different isolates. And we, we get it initially, we, we saw really clear uh, distinction if you look at presence absence of the six genes uh, between the different races. And you know, there's a, there's a little variation on that. But Liz took it further and she actually looked at the sequences within those six genes and was able to find that there were several copies in, in cases. And in which case in tropical race four, you can see quite a different pattern of sequence variation in the different six genes. Six one seems to be present in all of the Fusarium cubensi, but there's variations in it for tropical race four. So does that make a difference? We don't know, we're still trying to find out, but it's certainly a very convenient diagnostic. And we can see this and if we look a little bit further, yeah, looking at those uh, VCGs, which are particularly problematic in the ones which have been identified as a tropical race four that spread around the world, we can see this very um, distinct pattern uh, that is particularly with the 6 one i as it's identified. So these differences can be used as molecular targets. So we look at this and then we, Liz took a little bit further, she, she looked at how these different 6-1 sequences related to each other, just looking at the, the, the sequences from the different isolates, not just from uh, the cubensi, the banana infecting strains, but from, from other fusarium oxysporins. And she found that that, that 6-1, which was only, only unique to tropical race 4, wasn't found, and it was quite distinct from all the other 6-gene sequences, and wasn't found in any other of the, the banana infecting strains, but was found in other Fusarium oxysporins, for instance, ones from strawberry, um, or um, I can't, the writing's too small for me to read. But uh, so it's talking about, and I mean, Rep has published and others have published that there is, does seem to be strong evidence of horizontal gene transfer going on between Fusarium oxysporins. How frequent it is, it doesn't seem to be that frequent, but it's certainly uh, an interesting uh, issue to look at in regards to what makes something pathogenic or not pathogenic. Whether 6-1 is absolutely essential, there have been some knock knockout studies doing it and seem, it does seem to, um, some of the 6-1 genes, when they've been knocked out, it does seem to affect uh, pathogenicity. So that there's, there's a lot of interest in this area, not just in banana interaction, but in other crop plants. But in the meanwhile, it's very useful diagnostic and Lilia Carvelis has, has looked at this in more detail and developed our diagnostic for distinguishing between the different races based on the six genes. Okay, so um, in summary of this work on the six genes, it's 6 one i is not found in any other banana infecting strains, but similar sequences are found in other strains. Oh, there we are, strawberry pea and watermelon. And the interesting thing is that initially we didn't identify any six genes in the limited number of endophytes we looked at, but uh, Liz then did a subsequent study and found quite a lot of the endophytes do actually possess six genes. So it, it asks the question, are these six genes, or I should say the, the protein, the peptides that they're producing, are they essential for pathogenicity or are they just essential for colonizing banana tissue? So there's a a lot of work that can be done on that and to in basically to try and determine what six genes are involved in pathogenicity and what are involved in, in, in just making it uh, suitable to live in a banana environment. Uh, so I think it's, it's quite an interesting topic to look at. So I'm going to leave the, the six genes there and I'm going to leave the diversity and then I'm going to move on to another main um, target within our lab is looking at genetic resistance to fusarium wilt. To control fusarium, we need to know where it is. Uh, oh no, sorry, Mister, we'll have to skip through the epidemiology quite quickly, sorry, get back to resistance. To what extent does a fungus colonize the plants and where are the spores produced? Okay, so the long held theory is that chlamydospores of Fusarium oxysporum uh, last in the soil for decades, and that's what allows it to be persistent in the soil. But um, there's more and more evidence that they're persisting as endophytes and as saprophytes. So they do, they have chlamydia, they do produce chlamydospores, these long lasting uh, spores, they produce macro and microconidia. 
So we used a, a GFP strain of Fusarium oxybone. This uh, construct and, uh, had been transformed by Leanne Forsyth in, in our lab many years ago. And we got it out of the freezer and it's been very useful of late. No, so with confocal technology having improved over the decade, uh, Nolene was able to use it to, to look at the infection in banana. Now, lots of people have looked at the initial infection as a fusarium gets into the plant. But what we were interested to see was what was its persistence? How was it traveling up through the plant? And this was in, in concert with the, you know, with the tropical race four having arrived in the Tully region. We wanted to look at ways that we were going to be able to control it. Where was the fungus? How we were best to control it? And these fantastic images, I think, uh, just show initially here we've got on the left, it's on the roots. Here on the, the right, 70 days after inoculation, we're seeing the mycelia traveling up through the xylem and producing spores. But it's absolutely, I used to think that the response of the vascular wilt was the plant's response was closing down the vessel. But you can see here, it's absolutely clogged with mycelia growing up. And at that point, the leaves are still green. I mean, that's the intriguing thing. The fungus is traveling up through the xylem vessel a lot quicker than you're seeing the symptoms develop. So, um, <clears throat> And here's another example of the spores in the Cavendish plant. And you can see if you take a cut through the corm, you can see how the, the vasculature in these cases absolutely clogged with these uh, fluorescent fungi. Okay. And again, now the interesting thing that we saw from the study that Nolene was doing, we could see spores on the leaf surface. We could see sporulation happening there. Now it's pretty well established that it has to get in via the roots. It doesn't seem to be getting in via wounds in the pseudostem, so it has to get. So producing spores there maybe is less of a worry in that it's in the infection within the crop. It still has to fall down to the to ground and I don't quite know what happens then. But the fact that it is sporulating on leaf material is interesting. Uh, we can see little sporodopia here on the leaf surface. Uh, and in some on decaying leaves as well. So when you, you've got the trash you, or you, you de-leaf, you're getting it developing on that. Um, you're seeing chlamydia spores um, developing in the air chambers uh, and outside the leaves. So these are the resting spores. So the conclusion from the, 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 this material um, study was that Fusarium oxymum is confined to the xylem and healthy looking leaves, but as the leaves senesce, it starts to colonize extensively as a saprophyte. Now, the implications from that uh, immediately would be that trash from deleafing subsequently becomes a source of inoculum, including chlamydia spores, uh, so that just lying on the ground, it can then break down. Even when you deleafed it, the plant might not look infected that then becomes a source of inoculum uh, that's um, going to get mixed up within the soil. So Jay Anderson then did some work continuing on with the GFP strain, looking at alternate hosts, because it said we know it's an endophyte, what's it doing on other weeds? And we could find it colonizing the roots of weeds, but it wasn't really substantial. It was just you know a few uh, infections here and there, and that was with deliberate inoculations that we were doing. But more to the point, after we treated the weeds with herbicide, we're creating a nice um, amount of tissue that fusarium can go into saprophytic mode and colonize it. And that's what happened. We saw an increase in growth and therefore potential inoculum after herbicide treatment of the weeds. So then you question what happens if you put the herbicides onto a diseased plant? Because in a diseased plant, obviously you want you identify fusariums out there, you want to get rid of it quickly. So we did the same thing. I say we, Jay did the same thing. And she, she inoculated some pot plants and then treated them with herbicide after the fusarium had got hold. And what we then saw was an abundance of sporulation after spraying with herbicides. Certain, uh, she compared different herbicides and uh, they all really ended up with the same thing. So, and even treating them with a fungicide, then a herbicide, we still, we still got an abundance of sporulation. So this has implications for our containment controls um, and protocols thereof. Okay, now I'll get onto the host and I better do it quickly. Um, banana, 
basically bananas are freak. It's uh, it's uh, it's only the banana that we eat and consume is only there because we propagate it because it's it's sterile. Most of the banana commercial, certainly the commercial bananas, but even in some of the subsistence agriculture, you sometimes get some seeded ones, but not pro prolific seeders. Generally, they're sterile polypoids, they're part in the carpet, they're freak, they produce fruit without seed, no benefit to the plant, and it relies on clonal propagation. And classically, we talk about the A and the B genomes being a, a, having been a hybrid between these two species. But resistance is present, resistance fusarium wilt is present, it's in wild seeded deployed bananas, but I'm not quite sure if edibility is a correct word, but whatever it is, the, what makes it uh, favorable to us are the bananas that are part in the carpet and the ones that are sterile. So that even what breeding you need to do at the end of the day, you want to make it part in the carpet and sterile. So it makes it a little bit problematic in breeding. Um, on top of that, you've got long generation time, you've got large plants and uh, the confusion that's been happened with interploidy crosses is that the genetics are really quite messy when you start looking at banana. Whereas if you look at wheat, which has been cultivation for 10,000 years, we've been selecting and inbreeding that, it's, it's relatively uniform. If you compare it with banana, which is just basically accessions that have been taken from the jungle and fixed in time by clonal propagation. So, uh, we're particularly interested in one uh, line of music uh, cumulata subspecies malakensis because it has shown uh, individuals that are resistant and individuals are susceptible, which is convenient because if you're going to make crosses or try to look at segregation for resistance, it's good to have it both ways so that you can identify the resistance. The fruit are small, the seeded, and are absolutely of no commercial value whatsoever, but it's the resistance traits that we're interested in. Uh, it's some show resistance to tropical race four, subtropical race four, and race one. And um, so it can potentially help to understand the mechanisms of resistance by just focusing on these, not necessarily breeding with them, but focusing on the genetics to develop molecular markers. And that's what we've been doing. We take self pollinations, we do embryo culture because that's, it. although the seeds would be viable, we could sow them out and look at the variations and in germinations, etc. But by doing embryo culture, we can take them straight into propagation and clonal propagation and um, maintain those lines. Uh, so it allows for multiplication of lines through tissue culture. And so this is what banana seeds look like. These are the fruit. Sorry, I, I haven't got the scale in of the fruit, but these particular fruit are about, about eight centimeters long. Uh, and these are the flowers that we, we uh, pollinate now. Banana flowers, the first when they first come out from, uh, of a spike, you, the, maybe your first varies with the cultivars, maybe first six to sometimes 15 hands are going to be female only, and then the male flowers start developing, producing the anthers. So it's quite convenient in that respect for doing crosses, so that you know the first few hands are going to be female only. Um, and then these are the seeds that we do the embryo rescue for. So we've been doing crosses between resistance and susceptible and getting uh, segregation and trying to follow the traits. So much of this work has now been done by Andy Chen. He's been uh, funded uh, both by a combination of the, the, the Gates project and with Hort Innovation in, 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 at intervals as well. And initially we looked at a, pop, a smaller population we could we get lovely clean cut difference between resistance and susceptible. The susceptibles are highly susceptible in these malakensis lines, and the resistance uh, even even when we you know you sometimes see a little bit discoloration of the corn, but generally that's very very limited. Um, so then it gets into the realms of all the molecular analysis and doing sequence analysis, looking at initially we did it with SNPs, single looking for single nucleotide polymorphic culling and we were able to compare the resistance versus the susceptibles. And we found a region on chromosome three that was highly associated with the resistance. Uh, we've, then, we've since done more fine mapping and more uh, a larger population. And this Manhattan plot, I think is the best one that, that, that 
you don't need to understand the background behind it, but it just illustrates if you compare pain resistant and susceptible, we find this one region which, which spikes out on chromosome three, which seems to associate with the, the, the trait of resistance. So this is comparing resistant versus susceptible. So we then look at individuals, which we know we have to go through to the next generation to compare heterozygous, homozygous, resistance, homozygous, susceptibles. And we're getting to a nice clean point where Okay, I'll go to the next slide, yes, where we, 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 we've identified markers on the long arm of chromosome three that we believe that our resistance is there. And so there are many uh, genes there, it's, you know, it's not, not straightforward. And also, as I said before, banana genetics is messy. Uh, we compare what we see against the published uh, Pahang map, even though it's another Malakensis, there's still quite a lot of variation. So we're now at the point of trying to identify the genes in this region with fine mapping by looking for rare crossing over events to see if we can get the actual gene for resistance. But in the meanwhile, we can still use the marker associated with that. So something that's it's, um, genetically linked to the trait of resistance. And that has been used um, by international breeding programs, by INABAB, uh, um, by Embrapa, I meant, sorry, Embrapa, uh, also the CIRAD breeding program and also IITA. So they're using our marker to select individuals carrying resistance in the absence of being able to screen with the pathogen themselves. Having said that, we, I, there's a little bit of caution in that because we only seem to be able to identify that marker in lines that have a background with malakensis. There are other potential resistance sources. Um, and we have, you know, we know that a line known as Pissinjar boya, for instance, a line known as Calcutta 4. And if we look at this phylogenetic wheel of banana lines, uh, we can see that there, there is quite a lot of diversity from collections that this work has been done in the Czech Republic, where they, they look at the variation of all the, the banana accessions. And we can see that Malakensis is reasonably close to Kolkata 4, but Pissinjar Boya is quite distinct. So potentially we can, uh, there, there may be more than one resistance source. We don't know uh, to, but we need to look at that. Uh, because it's important that we don't just rely on the resistance from malakensis, however we're going to integress it into breeding lines, that potentially we would want to, well, I call it pyramiding genes, but certainly have a backup plan uh, should that resistance be overcome at some point by tropical race five, six or seven. So, so basically our marker is not detected in Pissinger Boya or Calcutta 4, so we're now working on generating new uh, uh, segregating populations, which is one thing I get to do is do the crosses. Uh, unfortunately, some of these plants are quite tall and it is a problem getting up to them to do the crosses. Uh, and, but we're crossing back onto our susceptible malakensis and then following up the segregating populations. Okay, so I'm finishing there. A few years ago, there was a sort of a lot of Thing in the press about banana again. The tropical race four was finally going to destroy banana production worldwide. And these are some images taken in China uh, that in, certainly there's a heck of a lot of um, spread of tropical race four in, in some of the, the, the southern provinces of China and the, where they had huge banana plantations and they've, they've all succumbed to tropical race four. And as a consequence of planting lots of dragon fruit, fruits and citrus now, um, which is, I quite like dragon fruit, but um, I don't think it is the end of banana. I think we have, we can find resistance. Uh, there is resistance out there. Not all cultivars are susceptible to tropical race four, but certainly most of the dessert bananas are, uh, but there is a way out and through quarantine, through good diagnostics, by understanding the pathogen, by resistance, we can get the better of it. My final acknowledgement slide is there's just so many, and I've lots of names missed off here, uh, but this is, has been a fantastic um, collaboration, this work between labs within Australia and internationally. Uh, and it, it's, it's really great seeing all that coming together. Uh, we, we've got through the Gates project, we, there's lots of uh, several international players involved and um, <clears throat> also here within Australia. 
I will stop now. Uh, hopefully I didn't overwhelm everybody. Uh, will I stop, stop sharing my screen?